This is the fifth video in my Cults and Serial Killers of the 1970s video series. This one is about the Zodiac Killer. He may not have killed as many people as Ted Bundy, but his main claim to fame is that he was never caught. There have been many theories about the identity of Zodiac, but as of this date, law enforcement has never confirmed his identity. It remains one of the most famous unsolved murders in American history. The Zodiac Killer is the pseudonym for a serial killer who operated in the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 1960s. The attacks took place in Benicia, Vallejo, Napa Valley, and the city of San Francisco. Zodiac murdered five people between December 1968 and October 1969, which included two couples and a cab driver. Two of the victims survived. He claimed to have murdered 37 people and has been linked to several cold cases in Southern California. Zodiac was the name that he gave himself through a series of messages that he sent to newspapers from 1969 through 1974, taunting the police and threatening violence if the messages weren't published. These messages were not only letters, but also cryptograms that were written in code, some that were able to be translated. Of the four cryptograms, two remain unsolved, with one being solved in 2020. In his communications, he claimed that he was collecting victims to be used as his slaves in the afterlife. The symbol with which Zodiac signed his letters was a circle with two perpendicular lines at its center. The last confirmed communication from Zodiac was received by the San Francisco Chronicle in January of 1974. Many other communications were received by law enforcement and media claiming to be from Zodiac, which were judged to be cranks, hoaxes, or unable to be confirmed as authentic. Seventeen-year-old David Faraday and sixteen-year-old Betty Lou Jensen were shot and killed December 20, 1968, on Lake Herman Road on the outskirts of Vallejo, California. The couple were on their first date and planned to attend a Christmas concert at Hogan High School, about three blocks from Jensen's home. They visited a friend before stopping at a local restaurant and after finishing their meal, drove out Lake Herman Road, and parked in an area that was known as Lover's Lane. Police patrolled the area periodically, warning young couples of the hazards of parking in such a remote area. Shortly after 11 p.m., the bodies of Faraday and Jensen were found by Stella Borges, who lived nearby. Mrs. Borges flagged down a patrol car, which proceeded to follow her back to the crime scene. The officers... Captain Daniel Pita and Officer William Warner checked for vital signs and found that Faraday and Jensen were still alive. Unfortunately, they didn't survive the trip to the hospital. Seven slugs were obtained from the two victims and the vehicle. The Solano County Sheriff's Department investigated the crime, but no leads ever developed. 19 year old Michael Magal and 22 year old Darlene Farron were shot on July 4, 1969, while sitting in Perrin's Corvair in the parking lot at Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo, California. This was four miles from where Faraday and Jensen were murdered. Another car approached and parked behind them. The driver got out of the car and approached the passenger side door of Farron's car, carrying a 9mm Luger and a flashlight. He fired at Magow and Farron multiple times. The assailant walked away from the car, but returned and shot each victim twice before driving off. Three teenagers discovered Farron and Magow and contacted police. Magow survived the attack, but Farron was pronounced dead on arrival at Kaiser Foundation Hospital. Magow was able to describe his attacker as approximately 30 years old and 195 pounds. He was a white male, around 5 foot 8 inches tall, with short, light brown curly hair. 
20-year-old Brian Hartnell and 22-year-old Cecilia Shepard, two Pacific Union College students, were stabbed on September 27, 1969, while picnicking at Lake Berryessa in Napa County, California. Hartnell survived, but Shepard died as a result of her injuries a couple of days later on September 29. Hartnell described a man about 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighing more than 170 pounds. He approached the couple wearing a black executioner's type hood with clip-on sunglasses over the eye holes. On his chest was a white cross circle symbol. The man approached Hartnell and Shepard with a gun and claimed to be an escaped convict. The man had some plastic clothesline and told Shepard to tie up Hartnell then did the same with her. At first, Hartnell believed that this was a robbery, but the man drew a knife and stabbed them both repeatedly. Hartnell and Shepard were stabbed multiple times. After hearing screams, a dentist and his son, who were fishing nearby, discovered Hartnell and Shepard and contacted park rangers. Napa County deputies Dave Collins and Ray Land were the first law enforcement officers to arrive at the scene. Shepard was conscious when Collins arrived and was able to provide him a detailed description of the attacker. She and Hartnell were taken to Queen of the Valley Hospital in Napa by ambulance. Shepard fell into a coma, never regained consciousness, and died two days later. Hartnell survived and was able to give detailed information to the police. Sergeant Kenneth Narlow of the Napa County Sheriff's Office took charge of the investigation and went to the hospital to talk to the victims. When Narlow finally arrived at the crime scene, he saw this on the car door of Hartnell's white Volkswagen, written in black felt tip pen. These were the dates of the killings in Vallejo and Solana counties. 29-year-old Paul Stein was shot and killed on October the 11th, 1969, in the Presidio Heights neighborhood of San Francisco. Stein was parked in the taxi zone in front of the St. Francis Hotel when he got a call to pick up a fare. When Stein arrived, a man got into a taxi and asked to be driven to Presidio Heights. Upon arriving at their destination, the passenger shot Stein once in the head, took his wallet and car keys, and tore away a section of his blood-stained shirt tail. Three teenagers across the street witnessed the incident and called the police. They observed the killer seeming to wipe the cab down before walking away toward the Presidio. This was on Washington Street between Maple and Cherry Streets. Two blocks from the crime scene, patrol officers Don Falk and Eric Zelms responded to the call and observed a man walking on a sidewalk and stepping onto a stairway leading up to the front yard of one of the residential homes. Unfortunately, the police radio dispatcher had alerted officers to look for a black suspect, so Falcon Zelms drove right past the killer without stopping. A search ensued, but no suspects were found. This was the last officially confirmed murder by the Zodiac Killer. At first, the Stein murder was believed to be a routine robbery that had gone wrong and ended up with Stein dead. That is, until October 13th, when the San Francisco Chronicle received a new letter from Zodiac. In the letter, he claimed credit for the killing, and to prove it, he had inserted a torn section of Stein's bloody shirt with the letter. The letter also included a threat about killing school children on a school bus if it wasn't published. Zodiac wrote, just shoot out the front tire and then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. The teenage witnesses worked with a police artist to prepare a composite sketch of Stein's killer. A few days later, this police artist returned, working with officers Falcon Helms to prepare a second composite sketch. Detectives Bill Armstrong and Dave Toskey were assigned to the case. On the night of March 22, 1970, Kathleen Johns was driving from San Bernardino to Petaluma to visit her mother. 
Johns was seven months pregnant and had her 10-month-old daughter with her. While she was driving, a car behind her began honking its horn and flashing its headlights. Johns pulled off the road and stopped. The man in the car parked behind her, approached her car, stated that he had observed that her right rear wheel was wobbling and offered to tighten the lug nuts. After he was done, he drove off. However, when John started driving, the wheel almost immediately came off the car. The man returned, offering to drive her to the nearest gas station for help. John's and her daughter climbed into his car. During the ride, he passed several service stations driving around back roads. When he finally stopped at an intersection, John saw her chance, grabbed her daughter, and jumped out and hid in a field. The driver searched for her, using a flashlight, and finally gave up and drove off. Johns finally made it to a police station and reported the incident. When Johns gave her statement to the sergeant on duty, she noticed the composite sketch from the Stein killing and identified him as the man who abducted her and her daughter. John's car was later found and had been torched. In a subsequent letter, Zodiac took credit for the abduction. However, law enforcement has never been able to confirm that this man was actually Zodiac. On July 4, 1969, within an hour after the attacks on Farron and Magal, a man phoned the Vallejo Police Department claiming responsibility for the attacks. He also gave them the location of the crime scene and, in addition, claimed responsibility for both that attack and the 1968 murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. Police were able to trace the call to a gas station phone booth about three-tenths of a mile from Darlene Farron's home and a few blocks from Vallejo Police Headquarters. Detectives lifted a palm print from the phone, but were never able to match it to any suspect. On September 27, 1969, after stabbing Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, Zodiac called the Napa Police Department to claim responsibility for the murders. At this point, he had already sent his cryptograms and letters and identified himself as Zodiac. On August 1, 1969, three letters were received at the Viejo Times-Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner. The letters took credit for both the Faraday-Jensen and magal Farron shootings. Each letter also included a cryptogram in which the killer claimed contained his identity and had information that only the killer would have known. The killer demanded the letters be printed on each paper's front page or else he would start killing people. In spite of the threats, the murders never happened and all three parts of the cryptogram were eventually published. Zodiac signed the three letters with a crosshair-like symbol all other letters received by law enforcement and the media would include this symbol. With the Bay Area Police Department on the case, along with FBI support, the San Francisco Examiner received another letter on August the 7th, starting with, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. This was the first time Zodiac had used this name. In the letter, he included details about the murders that hadn't yet been released to the public and claim that when the police crack the code, they will have me. Donald and Betty Harden of Salinas, California, cracked the 408 symbol cryptogram received by the San Francisco newspapers. The author said that he was committing the killings in order to collect slaves for his afterlife. No name was given. He said that he wouldn't give away his identity because it would slow down or stop his collection of slaves. On August 14, 1969, the San Francisco Chronicle received a letter from Zodiac addressed with a blue felt-tip pen. In it was not only a letter, but a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt. 
Zodiac copped a murdering taxi driver Paul Stein in this letter. On November 8, 1969, Zodiac mailed a card with another cryptogram consisting of 340 characters. This cryptogram, dubbed Z340, remained unsolved for over 51 years. On December 5, 2020, it was deciphered by an international team of private citizens, including American software engineer David Aranchak, Australian mathematician Sam Blake, and Belgian programmer Jarl van Ecke. In a decrypted message, Zodiac said he wasn't afraid of the gas chamber because it will send me to paradise all the sooner. The team submitted their findings to the FBI, which verified the discovery. The FBI stated that the decoded message gave no further clues to the identity of Zodiac. In the November 8th letter, there was also a jester's greeting card and a letter with a drawing of a dripping pen. On November 9th, Zodiac mailed a seven-page letter stating that two policemen stopped and actually spoke with him three minutes after he had shot Stein. Excerpts from the letter were published in the Chronicle on November 12th that included Zodiac's claim. On December 20th, exactly one year after the first two murders, Zodiac mailed a letter to Melvin Belli that included another swatch of Stein's shirt. The Zodiac said he wanted Belli to help him. A card had also been enclosed in which was written, Merry Christmas and New Year. Zodiac continued to communicate with the police as well as the media through all of 1970. He sent a greeting card to the San Francisco Chronicle, postmarked April 28, 1970. The card showed two old prospectors. The first was on a burrow, with the second riding a forked tongued dragon. In the card, Zodiac wrote the following message, I hope you enjoy yourselves when I have my blast. Zodiac threatened to bomb a school bus unless the paper published what he had written. This message was written on the back of the card. In a letter sent June 26, 1970, Zodiac said that he wanted people to wear Zodiac buttons and also claimed that he had shot a man sitting in a parked car. He was probably alluding to the murder of Sergeant Richard Ratatich, who was killed one week earlier after being shot by an unidentified gunman during a routine traffic stop. The San Francisco Police Department denied that Zodiac was involved in Ratatich's death, and the murder remains unsolved. In this letter, Zodiac takes credit for 12 victims. There is no evidence that this is true. In a July 24, 1970 letter, Zodiac took credit for the Kathleen Johns abduction, and he paraphrased a song from the Mikado, adding his own lyrics about making a little list of the ways in which he planned to torture his slaves in paradise. The letter was signed with a large, exaggerated cross-circle symbol. After several years of silence, the San Francisco Chronicle received a letter from Zodiac postmarked January 29, 1974 praising the film The Exorcist as the best satirical comedy that I have ever seen. The letter included a snippet of verse from the Mikado. There were more confirmed letters sent by Zodiac up until 1974 than the examples I have listed. 22 confirmed letters in all. Of course, this isn't counting the hoaxes and Zodiac wannabes, as well as those letters where print media and social media have indulged in their own theories. The number of Zodiac victims and the length of his crime spree are unknown. In the book I'm using for this video, Zodiac, author Robert Graysmith published a list of suspected victims connected to Zodiac. The list includes crimes which have either been solved or whose links to Zodiac have been proven to be incorrect. Although there were some suspects over the years, there was never an arrest or a conviction. There was only one suspect that was publicly named, Arthur Lee Allen, a former elementary school teacher and convicted sex offender. Allen died in 1992. 
The San Francisco Police Department marked the case as inactive in April of 2004, but reopened it in 2007. The case remains open in the city of Vallejo, as well as in Napa and Solano counties. The California Department of Justice has maintained an open case file on the murders since 1969. Napa Valley Detective Ken Narlo worked on the Hartnell Shepard case from the beginning until his retirement from the department in 1987. In May 2018, the Vallejo Police Department announced their intention to attempt to collect the Zodiac's DNA from the back of stamps he used during his correspondence. As of October 2022, no results from these DNA tests have been reported. In April 2004, the San Francisco Police Department marked the case inactive, citing caseload pressure and resource demands, effectively closing the case. However, they reopened the case sometime before March 2007. The case is open in Napa County and in the city of Riverside. The Zodiac murders are considered by many as the most famous unsolved case in American history. David Toski was a member of the San Francisco Police Department and the chief investigator in the Zodiac killings. He and his partner, Bill Armstrong, worked on the murder of cab driver Paul Stein. Toski was known as an attention getter with his bow ties and loud suits. Unfortunately, his need for attention caused him in 1978 to send letters to the San Francisco Chronicle praising his own work on the Zodiac case. Armistead Malpin, a San Francisco Chronicle columnist, filed a complaint against Toski on June 6, 1978, stating that he thought that a Zodiac letter in May of 1978 was forged by Toski. This development, in addition to Toski admitting that the letters of praise were indeed written by him to himself, caused Toski to wind up in hot water. Toski was later exonerated from the Zodiac letter forgery. Even though he was cleared of the forgery, the San Francisco Police Department felt that this letter didn't come from Zodiac either. Because of the self-aggrandizing letters, Toski was reassigned from homicide to robbery detail. After five years in robbery detail, he transferred to the sex crimes detail. Toski left the San Francisco Police Department in 1985, becoming Director of Security for St. Luke's Hospital in San Francisco. He was also Vice President of North Star Security Services and served as a technical advisor for the movie Zodiac in 2007. Toski died in 2018 at the age of 86 in San Francisco. Inspector Bill Armstrong worked the Zodiac case along with Dave Toski. He was the opposite in dress and mannerisms of the more flamboyant Toski, favoring short hair and business suits. After years of working homicide, he quit for good. After being present at a homicide on July 24, 1976, he quit the next day, saying he had looked at his last homicide and proceeded to transfer to Bunko. He retired at age 50 in 1978. Detective Kenneth Narlo was the investigator of the Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard attacks. Narlo retired from the Napa Valley Sheriff's Department in 1987 after 28 years in law enforcement. He was the last active investigator in the Zodiac case, all others having either left the force or retired. In 2007, Kenneth Narlow served as a consultant on the Zodiac movie based on Robert Graysmith's book Zodiac. At that time, he believed that Zodiac was still at large. Narlow died of cancer in 2010. After his release from the hospital, Mike Magow continued being treated for his injuries as an outpatient. He moved to a second-story apartment and dyed his hair red. After finishing his treatment, he moved to Southern California and moved in with his mother and twin brother under a different name. After recovering from his injuries, Brian Hartnell appeared in several documentaries as himself. Later, he adopted a more private lifestyle and is now a lawyer in Southern California. So, after half a century, 
the mystery of the Zodiac Killer remains unsolved. While researching this, I came across all sorts of theories about who he might be and what may have happened to him. In cases like this, that's to be expected, I guess. I was a little surprised that so much interest still existed about the case. I hope you found this interesting enough to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell to help my channel grow.